Maybe we should start uh, how we got to know each other, right? I think that was quite an interesting event also. Um, so I had a, an exhibition in the garden of a five-star luxury hotel, <laughs> which was already quite fun combination, right? So I had uh, these pillars made of metal that looked like pieces of a train painted uh, in the style of my canvases. Um, in these beautiful gardens, I don't know how, how old was the Brenners Park Hotel, do you know? So first of all, we can also say it was in a, in a special city uh, yes. where we met. It was Baden-Baden, so uh, a spa city, like the spa city in, 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 in Germany, in fact. So you can imagine like the, the, it, it's, it, it's a beautiful spot. Everything is super nicely uh, maintained and like very nicely made. Nothing like you can't even find something lying on the floor that doesn't belong there. So it's a very, very clean city, very nice. Uh, I was working there at the at the Kunsthalle at the at the local museum, and um, yeah, there's this Brenners Park Hotel, which is I think it opened its doors as one of the first uh, luxury hotels in in that in the in the 19th century, end of 19th century, and uh, there you can like. It's even it's even worse, you know. Everything is in like everything is in place, and everything is super beautiful and neat, and everybody's super nice. And uh, then Claudia was invited <laughs> to do a, a sort of an exhibition inside and outside, uh, as, like in the in the inside of the hotel, because there are some 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 like, rooms that you can that can be used for for exhibitions, and in the garden where there's very nice roses on the side and you, can, you have the river in front of the garden, like a small river floating by. And then, uh, yeah, there, was, uh, there were those metal plates. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And um, yeah, so the hotel said, yeah, we are going to have a nice opening. Um, they made a special drink and then uh, Luisa came to give a speech as uh, an introduction to, to the show. And we didn't know each other before. Um, and we met, we talked, I think, for two minutes and it immediately clicked. And I saw like, wow, this woman completely understands what I do without even me telling her. Um, and like um, bridging like street art graffiti and uh, also contemporary art, which is very rare to find because usually you have specialists who know about contemporary art or you have the ones who know the whole history of graffiti and how everything works. And Luisa is one of those rare individuals who really does know her thing. <laughs> so um, when we discussed making a book, she was my first choice to, to ask because I thought like she's gonna get um, what I did for 25 years because that's not an easy task to do, I think. Um, starting in the 90s, um, painting graffiti under bridges and on several surfaces <laughs> uh, at uh, late hours. Um, to you know, coming here and having a show like this and um, bridging this was really difficult, I think. Uh, and in the past five to ten years, I think I had four to five publishers approaching me, asking me to do a book about my work. And I never felt it was the right time. I thought like it's so strange. Um, I still feel young, and then doing a book at this age just felt strange. And also. I always thought, like, how am I going to put this in one book? Having the classic graffiti, the photorealistic murals, um, the way to abstraction, the abstract murals, and now also like uh, contemporary art in, in such beautiful spaces. So to me, it felt like five different books, and I didn't even know where to start. Um, and then with uh, Henny, who, who produced fantastic books, I thought like, okay, this is the right time now to, to do this, yeah. And then I called Luisa <laughs> and asked what she was thinking of, uh, of doing that, so yeah, and she managed. So maybe you can... Yeah, that's how we landed here then in yes. the end, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, going back to, to uh, when we met, uh, for me it was like, as you said, it was quite interesting to see how uh, how your your artistic practice can't be grasped easily because it it has uh, such a manifold form and so different ways of uh, expression that I really got interested in how you work in those different genres, how you how you connect things, and how you kind of establish this this um, practice in between. I think this. In between this is kind of a leitmotif mm -hmm. 
for your work, but as well for the book, of course, because that that. Uh, like doing this book was a great task, but a, but a wonderful one because it was really um, going through all those different chapters and all those different layers that uh, one can find in in your work and over the years, over 25 years, as you say. So um, that was also kind of the starting point uh, for, for doing this book, kind of how do we merge this? How do we get this together? Because it is, of course, all connected. I, I like to see this, this um, exhibition we are sitting in here at the moment as one chapter of the book, like uh, the last chapter of the book, like how, um, how your practice is working out at the moment, what the modes of expression that you, that you are working in at the moment. But it's also just a moment and one aspect of, uh, of all the other things that you are doing and that are connected. So this in-betweenness is really something something that uh, for me also were doing the book but I think also f like uh, in, in the talks we had a lot about that um, gets it all together in a way mm -hmm. and um, yeah so how, how to tell a story uh, I think we can we can also um, yeah talk about some stations or some some chapters in your life and in, in uh, your artistic practice but how to tell a story that has uh, so many shades in a way and i think yeah in the end we, we found a way to 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 uh, put this all together so um especially with, with, with chapters that kind of connect, that uh, do not uh, separate uh, this, uh, your works as this is just graffiti, this is mural work, this is working on canvas, this is maybe something else, uh, but to see how this all is connected. And I think this is the special thing about your work, so that uh, you can see um, everything next to each other and um, the connections in between. So, so if we see the, the canvases here in the space, of course you can see that it they are connected with the street, as the title is saying, street to canvas. But maybe, we, yeah, the, the title could also be street to canvas, to street to canvas, to street again, mm -hmm. because um, I think that's the, also the special thing. Uh, so, yeah, but <laughs> just, uh, just to start with. So this in-betweenness, how do you see that? How, what, what does this mean for you? Does, is, it, uh, like, is it an expression that fits for you? or? Uh, how would you describe what you're doing, yeah. in fact? I think I thought about that a lot lately. And I think my main goal for whatever I do, like the top line always is freedom. And as soon as I'm a contemporary artist or a graffiti artist or a mural artist, there are drawers. You have to put me in. And then I'm within the frame. And I hate being in a frame because it just, um, doesn't help me come up with new ideas. As long as you're not in a frame, you can jump between the drawers, you can even create a new drawer, you know, or just, um, you know, remove the whole furniture. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and I think that's the main goal for me. I like, also like the way I um, developed over the years was really always looking for something new, something exciting, never um, standing still in a way uh, and also trying to do what I love and what I find that interests me with perfection and then when I mastered one thing going to the next and looking for the next challenge and I think if I would ever be one of those things I could never do that you know and that also of course it makes it difficult for some people from the outside to put me into a dwarf because that's how we are as humans. No matter what we do, we have presumptions and we need to put a label on things because it makes life easier. Um, so yeah, I don't make people's life easier, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> when they want to write about me or when they want to design a book, for example. Um, and yeah, so that was quite a challenge for, for the book. And the way we started, kind of like trying to, to put this in, in one was me going through all my archives, 25 years of work. And that was intense, a couple of months of work, also with paper, like photographs on paper. And then trying to set a timeline and uh, that's how the book is also structured because otherwise I think we couldn't have approached it um, easily. So we kind of uh, managed to make it the timeline how I started to how we came today, like to what's happening today. Yeah. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And maybe we can also start uh, with how you started, mm -hmm. because we, we really we decided, or especially you decided also to, to yeah. put into this book the first, uh, <laughs> your first coffee I have to show yes. it, because it's uh, just, uh, just let me check. Yes, so that's go. the first time I think I've, I've really like publicly shown my very first Yes, so it's so pretty. Yeah, we, we, we put it very small on, yes. the, on the first side, so it's, it's um, kind of you can, embarrassing. You can, <laughs> you can have a look later, but it's. Um, I think it's a good starting point to really put that in the book. That yes. was uh, really the first uh, uh, try to to make a graffiti in uh, 1995, I yes. think. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> You've been 15 years old then, back then, and uh, you've been living in in the in, in Bautzen, so yeah. like a middle uh, city in um, in eastern Germany. So yeah. uh, in the 90s, that, that was also a special time. Of yeah. course, it, it was shortly after after a system has just gone, has disappeared, and mm -hmm. uh, it was those years that were c quite interesting because everything was kind of in movement mm -hmm. and. Um, of course, it was not in, in Western Germany, where there was already uh, a tradition, like a small tradition of, of graffiti uh, sprayers and writers uh, that, uh, that swapped over in the, I think, in the 80s already. I think in Munich, there was the first, uh, there was the fir first train bombed in the 80s. So that was the, like the first time in Germany that this happened after they got the information from, from New York City, of course. And, um, but you haven't been in, in, in Munich or in Berlin, but in a, like a, in a smaller town that is more or less uh, known uh, for, for a big jail, in fact, in, in, the, in, the, for, in the GDR. So how did you get in contact? How did it all start? How did this uh, Ottifant, which is the, like the, the, the figure you can find in the, um, in the first graffiti, how, how did you get the contact to that? Um, so I've, I think I've at least not consciously remember ever seeing graffiti in real life, actually, because th there was none. Um, also, when I went out to, to travel a little bit around with my parents, um, I can't really remember having seen graffiti or not consciously for sure. Um, but in school, I had a friend who, uh, you know, there, you always have some cool kids in school who do certain things and uh, skateboarding or whatever. And there was one who uh, was doing graffiti or he painted actually graffiti on T-shirts, you know, because I had not seen it on, on the wall. Um, and he talked me, uh, uh, we talked and he told me about graffiti and he had this book, Graffiti Art Germany from uh, like such, such thick book um, from a German publisher, small edition. And uh, he borrowed me the book to, to read. I read it in one night. I started the same day and I just couldn't put it away. It was so fascinating because I have always been drawn to painting and drawing. Um, as a kid, I was a bit hyperactive and the only thing that could really calm me down was drawing and painting. Then I had all the patience in the world. And uh, there was a whole scene, a whole culture around basically creativity you know so writing a name so you can choose your own identity which is something every teenager looks for as a teenager you look for your own identity who are you um, you want to belong but at the same time you don't want to belong not to your family at least or to the system so kind of like you need to be a rebel um, and at the same time you look for peers so that was fantastic i had the opportunity to create an own identity, to find my own name, use my creativity to kind of compete and make my name. Um, and at the same time, you know, kind of like doing something that's not uh, conform with the system. Um, so the very next day, I went to the next hardware store, <laughs> bought four or five uh, carp spray paints that were horrible quality, not covering at all. And then I took a friend from school with me at three o'clock in the afternoon to this <laughs> garage park <laughs> and painted this backside of the garage with that. And I was so disappointed because I was like, it looks so easy in the book. And then it was so hard to do it on your own. <laughs> it's just like, and I, the paint was watery and it didn't cover. And I was like, why are all those um, pieces and these books so bright and so detailed? And this looks like, Shit, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there would be a beep in the US now. Um, but 
<laughs> I, I was really so disappointed and so frustrated. But at the same time, it was always, it's my personality. If you tell me you can't do something, then I say like, yes, I can. So it was also good that it was really hard to do because I thought like, no, I have to figure out how this is done. I want to do this. Um, and then after that, I started sketching basically every day. So I tried to find my own style. I had several names um, until I kind of like landed with Madsy. Um, and uh, yeah, so I step, step by step, I got better and better. Uh, and then I also got some legal walls to paint. Uh, one, for example, was a wall in the classroom in my, at my school. Um, and then there was a local youth club where all the skateboarders were hanging out and uh, they had some walls that could be painted. Um, yeah, and then also pretty soon I started trying to travel to larger cities like uh, Dresden, for example, was, was the next station. Or also later I went to Munich mm -hmm. and, and these places. Um, and realizing also then that, that I improved, but that I was still pretty crap at what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when you go to the big cities, there's so much competition and so many writers who have done it for a lot longer than you have. Um, so yeah, it was also a battle, really, like with myself, uh, with getting better, getting my name out there. Yeah, so. And of course, the, the, this whole scene has changed since then. But back then, one can say it was kind of a boys club. Totally. that you uh, got into or yes. that you had to, to fight to get into. Yeah. Was that a big issue or how did you cope with that? Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because in the beginning, for example, when I read the book, I didn't think about that. I just thought like, wow, awesome pieces and all the pictures that only showed guys. But it's kind of like it didn't ring a bell with me at all. So I was really like kind of... Uh, <laughs> getting in there and yeah, whatever, you know. <laughs> so it only started after a while uh, when I came to like larger cities that I really realized that it, it was a topic that I was, I was female, you know. Um, but also I think that kind of mindset that I didn't care and also I didn't make it a topic also helped me because I never asked for special treatment or um, expected anything, you know, to, yeah, so I think that was also helpful for me in a way, you know, just like this mindset of being ignorant <laughs> to a certain degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, the scene has changed in many ways. For one thing, in general, it's a lot more accepted now. Um, also with like street art and mural art coming up, also graffiti is changing and more accepted now. Um, but also, of course, there are a lot more female artists nowadays than there were 25 years ago. Um, and when I painted at Graffiti Jams, for example, so where a lot of people come together and paint, I was usually the only woman. And what I really understood was that every time the press came, everybody wanted to take pictures of me. That was so annoying. Because, it's, of course, it's much more interesting to take a picture of the only female there that's painting a wall. It makes a nicer picture than a couple of dudes painting walls. <laughs> and, <laughs> but the, the problem with that was also that the spotlight was always on me. And that when you start and you're crap at what you do, that's not nice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when you start to become better, then it's fine. You know, then it's like, OK, yeah, I can handle that. But that was also something that pushed me, I think, because I knew I have to perform because all eyes are, are on you, you know, and I didn't want to be crap. Mm -hmm. So, um, and of course I had a lot of uh, guys who were asking stupid questions and, you know, they, who were teasing me and everything you can imagine, you know, but um, I didn't care so much. I, I, I don't remember. I just never gave them anything to, to work with, you know, and then I got better pretty soon and then suddenly they were all quiet and just... <laughs> watching me shutting up <laughs> so yeah and then like for the scene quite late you decided also to 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 be part of crews so to be yeah. part of uh, of groups that uh, that go painting to, or writing together mm -hmm. but it was quite late also for that reason maybe yeah uh, i think it was i painted for five years almost yeah i've painted for five years until i joined the first graffiti crew mm -hmm. so it was for for several reasons for one thing i didn't feel i was good enough I was always my biggest critic. Um, I was really hard on myself. 
So I always uh, like my pieces are really bad. So also when I got criticism from from the guys, I didn't care because nobody could criticize me as well as I did myself. Um, so that was one thing. Then another thing at that point, I of course understood that I'm an alien kind of in this world. So I also didn't expect being accepted or being part of a group. Um, and also in the in the beginning, uh, when I started realizing that I might be a bit different, I didn't want to be judged by being a woman. So I usually went out painting on my own, mm -hmm. and I tried also to not use pink. You know, like I didn't paint pink pieces. Yes, <laughs> it's a statement. <laughs> so. Um, also, I didn't paint rounded pieces, like all the things you would expect from a woman, you know, painting something soft and pink and fluffy and butterflies and flowers, none of that. They were dragons, they were really aggressive uh, pieces, machines, whatever, and also a name that didn't point directly at me being a woman. And it actually also took about 10 years until people really realized I was a woman. So uh, even until today, sometimes I get uh, Oh, he did a nice wall, so oh, <laughs> it's, it's uh, very rare now, but uh, it took a while. So yeah, and then after about five years um, painting, I was invited uh, by Slider of the Bandits crew in Dresden, which was, uh, of course, at that time for me, the big city. Mm -hmm. um, and they had some graffiti jams every year and organized some really nice walls in the city. So they invited me to come there and paint with them. And they were really cool guys. Nobody made it a topic that I was a woman. You know, we did a really nice production. Um, and it was just, they just became friends, you know, people I was really liking to, to hang out and uh, we could uh, discuss, you know, nerdy stuff about graffiti. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then they asked me if I want to join the crew. And then, yeah, of course, it made sense for me. So for me, it was always important that the people in the crews that I join are friends first. And second came if, if they are known, because usually in the graffiti scene, it's kind of like an honor to be part of a certain crew. So when, they, when somebody asks you, you would never say no to one of the big names, you know, because it also, of course, makes you more, more known. Um, but for me, that was never the point. For me, the point was, uh, first of all, that these people are really people I like to hang out with. So uh, the Bandit crew was the first. Uh, then the second was the Walnuts crew in, in New York because I was uh, living in New York for a while. Uh, I got a scholarship to, to um, work for a couple of months in New York and every minute I had of my free time, every weekend I was going out painting, painting walls all over New York, uh, New Jersey. And uh, the guys from the Walnuts crew, I got to know them uh, at the B-Boy barbecue in Philadelphia. And the same thing, we, we had a good time. Uh, and then they just brought me to every wall you can imagine <laughs> on the East Coast during a couple of months. And then I joined that crew. Um, and then later it was the uh, Stick Up Kids uh, from Cantu. So first I got to know Clark Kent and then also later Cantu. And we also got, uh, yeah, became really good friends and uh, had a good time. And actually Clark Kent and me for a while, we were thinking of uh, forming our own crew, just two of us, because we were doing a lot of pro big productions together and it was working really well. Um, and then we were like, yeah, why would we do that? He's in the stick up kits. And then kind of like was nice to, to be part of that crew too. So it really kind of like made sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we go back to um, like to the bouts in time and to this whole um, like to, to really entering the graffiti world, which has a lot of rules, in fact, and it, it although it doesn't seem like it when you when you look at graffiti in the streets uh, and you're not involved in the whole scene, it, it might uh, look that there's, it, there's no rules at all. But in fact, there's yeah, there's a lot of rules that you have to stick to uh, to be part of it and stuff like that. And as you said that. Um, and one really gets this feeling also when, when, when one sees your work that you, that you are kind of, you, you're getting into that direction. You, you see that the, like this is the set of rules and you want to be a master in it. So you, you really go like uh, as far as you can go 
to mastery, to really um, being able to, to, to stick to the rules and get the best out of it uh, that you can do. And then you go beyond. And then you go over, the, you, you step over the border and you, you, uh, you put yourself next to those, set, to those sets of rules, um, for example, of this scene or of the art scene as well. And um, like in, in those younger years, you, you, you quite went quite straight to, this, to this, uh, the, this career of graffiti artists in a way. But of course, there was, there was always this, this, this other way. Because you, you, you said already you started drawing and, and painting even when you're younger, when you were younger than, uh, uh, so graffiti wasn't the first uh, kind of involvement with, uh, with artistic expression. And that, like, uh, that never stopped really in a way. And then you decided to, to study, but you didn't decide to study art. But you went to a different direction, like also kind of this in betweenness. There is, is yeah. again. So, yeah. so it was interesting because when I was 16, I actually had my first solo show uh, mm -hmm. with uh, watercolors and drawings, and it was all um, figurative. And uh, I also did sculpting, and um, it had nothing to do with graffiti. That was really before. But I had, like at that point, in a small city, I had never met one artist who could make a living of art. Mm -hmm. So I thought like, no, I'm not going to study sculpting or art. I, I don't want to make a living teaching others how to draw, because basically that's how I uh, got to know the other artists. So um, I said I want to go in a direction that is close to it, but different. So I chose graphic design. And uh, of course, that also helped me with uh, typography learning about uh, fonts, letters. Um, I also like hand drew alphabets in Fraktur and all those old uh, uh, writings, you know, like hand lettering is a big thing nowadays. I did all of that uh, in my studies um, 20 years ago. Um, but of course also that helped me learn about uh, letter structure and everything. So it kind of like also helped me learning and understanding a bit better about um, the graffiti letters and also uh, handling colors is another thing. Of course, you, you, you have to make layouts, for example, have to, to use photography with uh, letters, fonts and everything and put that together. Um, and also thinking complex is, is a thing that you do as a designer that also helped me, you know. Um, but at the same time, it never really made me happy because clients can be really annoying. And <laughs> usually you have a good idea and then the client comes and says like, no, I want the blue to be changed into red and I don't know what. Uh, and that was uh, something I really after a while couldn't handle because it was not freedom. So I mean, I, until I understood that it took a while, but um, so I always had graffiti on the side. As you said, I went by all the rule books, but uh, you know, you can do everything within the rule book and then suddenly you hit a wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, there's no freedom when you hit the wall. So I had to get on the wall and then over the wall, kind of. Um, so that was kind of the, the same thing with uh, first studying graphic design and then kind of like leaving this career to actually do try to, to become, an, become an artist. Actually, I did become an artist, so <laughs> I didn't try. <laughs> you, you, you decided here in London, right? Uh, yes. Because you had like the, the, the second part of your studies was, was here. Exactly. Yes. And um, like in the end, mm -hmm. You made the decision to, to go into that direction. Yes, there was a kind of uh, the, like the past uh, 10, 15 years, I thought a lot about that now being here in London because uh, in 2006, 2007, I started, studied here at Central St. Martins uh, as a postgraduate in uh, character animation. And I loved animation because it's so complex, you know, and you can uh, create a film and it moves and suddenly you bring life into something that was fantastic. But I understood also that sitting there, uh, spending days and weeks to create like one second of film was just not for me. I didn't have the patience, you know. Um, but um, somehow I was uh, pretty good at it and I got a job offer on the last day when I finished my studies here. So I could have become an art director in the city of London, uh, in a nice agency, uh, earning good money. And they gave me a week to decide. 
So for one week, I was driving on the bus, uh, 159, <laughs> uh, through London, back and forth. Uh, like I remember one day I did nothing but just being on this bus and uh, trying to look inside because I understood that they, they gave me this offer. And of course, I was uh, pleased with it. But at the same time, I really felt like I don't want that. And I was completely confused because, I mean, I, I was working for Ogilvy in New York. Um, then I came to London and by kind of like the, all this career that I dreamed of was right in front of me and I didn't want it suddenly. And I was really a bit shocked about that. And then I, I, I understood I have to try as an artist. I have to. So I said no. <laughs> to, <laughs> I went back to Germany, started working as a waitress to get my first studio, small space, and I started painting. So yeah, London was a big uh, thing for me, on, like on the way to where I am now. Mm. So yeah, and I'm really happy being back now and understanding that I definitely made the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think we all agree. <laughs> Maybe not the agency, but well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then that time that followed this decision, that was really interesting because the, I think that was the time where there happened a lot in your, in your practice, which we, could, we can also see in, yes. like in the book in, 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 in some chapters, that mm -hmm. really that was the time of, of experimenting, of like going beyond, of going like overstepping borders, of trying out, of finding a way to, to do your art in a way. So, um, and to kind of yeah, do it, uh, differently than, than everybody else in a way before. So uh, that was a time that was, I guess it was not easy also because you really, you, you really were jumping into that quite intensely uh, as you told me, but uh, yeah, what, uh, yeah. how did you get into that? Yeah. So that was definitely like three to five years that were super intense and uh, also really hard. I cried a lot. Um, so for one thing, uh, physically, because the first challenges I put on myself were not just uh, finding an own style, but also pushing graffiti and what I learned to the absolute maximum. So painting photorealistic with every detail you can imagine. And uh, I mean, painful means going up and down a ladder about 500 times a day when I painted the 700 wall falling off the ladder, uh, like hurting my knees because I jumped down and, you know, still continuing painting. Um, or I don't know, I mean, everybody who ever used a spray can, if you use a spray can every day for eight to 10 hours for four months, it kind of like starts hurting. <laughs> so, um, so, so that was one thing, but it, uh, then also, um, painting some of those photorealistic walls uh, also in a massive format that hasn't been done in graffiti by one single person but it was not my idea to prove somebody else it was to prove to myself I thought like okay there's a huge wall and I just want to know where my limits are because I always had this feeling I have so much energy I don't really know where to put all this energy so let's see um, if I paint 700 square meters photorealistic what happens you know so it took me four months to paint this wall and then I finished it in November um, 2010 and I thought like well I finished it awesome but I could still go further so where are my limits I still didn't know I just knew that 700 square meters is not my limit mm -hmm. um, so I like kind of tried that, but then also um, the other thing that was really painful was, as you said, like breaking with the rule book and trying to find myself because I understood that I've pushed everything. I found my own graffiti style, but I don't want to do this for another 20 years. It just gets boring for me. I had to do something more and I had to do so also something that's more myself and that's not within a set rule book. Um, and doing that was really hard. So what I did first was I changed the tools because I thought if I use spray can on the canvas, it didn't really work. So I used brushes, I used watercolors, just as I did when I was 16 for my solo show back then. Mm -hmm. But painting graffiti with watercolors, that's also something I've never seen before. And at that time also the first transparent spray paint uh, came out on the market. And I thought like, okay, there's transparent spray paint. What can you do with it? 
And then I started painting a piece only with that and it looked like watercolor and I was like, wow, okay, I know how to use watercolor. So it was always like going on the wall, going back to the studio, going back on the wall, and then um, step by step this kind of uh, style evolved, you know. But of course I had nights, I usually painted at night until six in the morning at that time. Um, when I was so frustrated because the canvases looked like shit and I still felt like this is not what I want. I didn't know what I wanted, I just knew this was not it, you know. And I wanted to bring this uh, energy of painting and also that's in, inside myself on the canvas, but I just didn't know how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a couple of months or years, let's say, uh, of this process until I came to this style. And um, in the beginning, I did a few smaller walls that uh, are also on the book, like the first transparent walls. But then when I finally had something like uh, painted on a canvas that I thought like, yeah, this is it. This could be working. I thought, okay, now I have to try how this looks really big on a wall. Mm -hmm. So because I said, I'm gonna disappoint a lot of people. They will be, be like, what is that now? You know, going from photorealistic to abstract. Mm -hmm. for, for some people who followed me probably from one day to, a, to the other, of course for me it was a couple of years, but you know. So I thought if I do it, I have to do it big, mm -hmm. like a statement, you know, and not just being shy in the corner trying like, you know. And uh, so the first wall, we are back in London, I painted with this style was 2013 in Shan Street here in Shoreditch. So, um, I painted the very first wall in this abstract style there. And then uh, two months later in Germany, also 500 square meters big, um, and in Leipzig. Mm -hmm. At the Alte Messe. At the Alte Messe, oh, yes, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. So, and then um, I went again like, to the wall and then back to the studio and continuing to um, kind of like really find my own style and feeling comfortable. And it was really interesting. It was really like feeling like I'm in a straight jacket to step by step getting out of it and uh, being myself and being comfortable with being myself also that's another thing you know like not having a problem with maybe disappointing people which wasn't the case which was interesting mm -hmm. because a lot of people actually were supportive of that and a lot of graffiti artists still saw where that was coming from you know um, and then introdu being introduced to a totally different kind of audience also because graffiti is very closed, you know, it's like within the scene. So you are painting not for the general public, but just for a few people who, all, who see it the same way. But suddenly I was painting something everybody could kind of like relate to. Mm -hmm. That was also new to me, that people would speak to me in the street, not aggressively, but actually friendly and being interested in what I was doing. And then also doing the first exhibitions uh, with that kind of work. and being accepted and people actually buying that kind of work was really uh, um, amazing to me because I didn't expect that. Like my, my first thoughts when I came up with the style was like, okay, I'm going to start from scratch now. So nobody's gonna like that. Mm. Yeah. But then it came differently. Uh, yes. And it's, it's, it's really this interesting time when, um, uh, when you took this step, like, it was some years that you that it took you to 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 go that way but it's really interesting also you can see it in the book that from going from from the 700 wall which is like super hyper realistic uh, which is also telling a story like kind of the the story of the graffiti writer of the graffiti space sprayer until now your story uh, so you, um, i had the chance some some weeks ago in fact to to visit this wall it's still there so it's uh, so when you go like it, it's uh, Next to the the, the, the train um, way between Halle and Berlin, yes. like in the, in the middle of nowhere, there is the 700 wall where you can you still see the paint, and it's it's a kind of you see that it's 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 getting old, but of course there's still this 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 hyper realistic this like this uh, focus on every detail, which is so. Uh, impressing also, like, very impressive in, in, in this work, how, how you, you got to those very like, small details, like, like this, uh, I don't know, the, the eyes of the, of the figures and stuff like that. And then you took this, you came to this break that we can still see in, in the canvases here. So as you said, it's not only the, um, 
the motives that change, but the material that you that you went back to the studio and not like working on paper and doing uh, like uh, scrabbling like normally one would do um, as a graffiti writer, but going back to canvas. Mm -hmm. So, and maybe we can also talk about this material because, of course, canvas is very cl a classical. Uh, a very classical um, material. It, it's, uh, it has a big part in art history, which you touch upon suddenly. Uh, as you said, you, of course, you, you bring it to the walls in, in the public space, but you also bring it to the studio, to this very, um, yeah, very traditional place for an artist uh, like uh, that. Uh, that was the center of, of art history for for centuries, one can say. And now we are like, you're sitting in front of works that, yeah. You still can't grasp. Of course, you can you can hang them in in a gallery like here, and they look beautiful, and they are um, they have so many layers in it. You can still see um, the practice that you um, that you were doing so long, um, coming from graffiti in a way, but also coming from art, mm -hmm. from from like fine art from from this uh, from this direction. And it's quite interesting to see how this is really all connected uh, in those works here, but I see uh, we're over the time already. Is that true? 